This episode of Shadowversity is appropriately sponsored by World Anvil, one of the very best world building tools to organize, keep track of, and share your incredible fantasy worlds for role playing, writing, game development, and more. There are heaps of new quality of life updates, including video tutorials so it's even easier to get started. One of the most awesome updates, which is literally right around the corner, is probably already out depending on when you see this video, are family trees. This is a tool to help you keep track of noble lines, vampire bloodlines, hereditary conditions, diseases, and even inheritances. And seriously, if you've seen the bloodlines and histories in something like, say, Game of Thrones, you can really see that if you want to create an immersive fantasy world, going in such detail like this, having a tool like the family tree tool that's coming to World Anvil is going to be phenomenally beneficial and helpful. I know as a writer myself. Keeping track of all the various details from the cultures to the cities to the important people to the maps to the histories. The more detail you can add the more realistic and immersive your world becomes but the more difficult it is to keep track of things. But with World Anvil you can link things together. If you're talking about an important event and some person played an important role in that event you can link to that person's profile. It has interactive maps and it's just a brilliant tool to keep track of this vast fantasy world that you might want to build. Never lose track of the details of your immersive fantasy world. Show your world to everyone else and get them hooked. And the best thing, most of these features come absolutely free with some more exclusive awesome features available if you'd like to sign up. So please do go check out World Anvil. It's like I said, one of the best tools for world building. There's a link in the description below. Greetings, I'm Shad, and I want to talk a little bit about world building, but not the general run-of-the-mill kind of um, make your map, make your nations, and interesting locations, stuff like that. I want to talk about how to take your world building to the next level. Now, what qualifies me to talk on such a subject? Well, I am a published author. My novel, Chronicles of Everfall, Shadow of the Conqueror, is available in print, ebook, and audiobook, and is very well received. At the moment, uh, the audiobooks are sitting at a rating of 4.6 out of 5 stars from over 2 thousand ratings. So people are really loving my novel and one of the most consistent compliments that come up in reviews for my novel is how much they loved the original world building. That the world building of my novel makes it really stand out because it's fresh, it's different. And so what did I do to uh, achieve such a standard? And that's what I want to share to you. What has been my approach and some things that I think can help you do the same thing. I'm not saying you have to copy everything I do, but I do feel at least there might be one or two things that you might be able to hone in on and realize, okay, that's, a, that's something useful to do and to emulate. Now, before I mention what the core key kind of mindset that really helped me out with my world building, it should mention, and it's important to mention, that world building is not going to be the thing that makes your novel. It can be a thing that breaks your novel if it's done terrible, but even if the world building is phenomenal, if your characters and story aren't up to scratch, you're not really going to be able to have a great engaging novel. Now, that perspective can sometimes cause people to devalue the world building side, and I, I disagree, because proper good world building can be one of the greatest compliments that enhances an already good story and good characters, and it can be such a phenomenal source for conflict in the story. So that is how the story can be enhanced phenomenally by the world building. How so? Well, there are so many interesting, unique kind of elements that you can add in, and we'll get to some of the specifics later on, but absolutely. So world building needs to be understood in its correct context. It is by no means without value. It holds tremendous value. It's not going to be the thing that your story is going to be resting upon for its success, okay? Because separate to the setting, the setting, you have your plot and characters, and the plot and characters are going to be the main things that will set your world apart. The world building almost is like the foundation, not necessarily foundation, actually, but it's the, the complementary thing that can make it so much more engaging. And then, of course, you have those three things, setting, plot, and character held together by your prose, which is a complete separate half to... Uh, was storytelling, okay? And it's, and it's just as an important a half. I talk about this in my video, How to Write a Novel, okay? Because 
understanding prose is still something that I'm trying to perfect. I think there's no writer in the world that has felt like they've perfected it, that they're not trying to get better, because it is the prose that is the bridge that brings your story to the reader. And the more effective a bridge it is, the easier it is for your readers to enjoy the story. But anyway, we're not focusing on that. I just wanted to point it out because we need to understand where things fall in context. So now let's bring it all back to world building, such a significant thing that can enhance a story and also might be one of the most enjoyable things of your story but that's only if the characters and plot of the story aren't getting in the way if they all work together and then you have really good world building it can be one of the most beloved features of a story which has really happened with my own novel okay so the mindset that i had when i was approaching my book okay was simply why be constrained to what we think a world should be? This is fantasy. We have sky's the limit. And so it started off with the uh, simple mindset of, um, why do we always think it needs to be on a planet? Planet, like a, a spherical orb in space. Well, that's our main point of reference. That's what we live on. So it kind of makes sense to place people in worlds on spherical orbs in space. But it doesn't have to be. This is fantasy. Terry Pratchett certainly didn't think so. Look at Discworld. There's a reason why it's called Discworld. And uh, so kind of looking at this other example, because I like the idea, the concept, when people once believed the world, once believed the world was flat. <laughs> that idea can actually be really interesting in a fantasy setting where there is literally an edge of the world that you could fall off of, and it creates unique kind of conflicts and limitations within the world. If the character is trying to run away from something and they're running really, really far in a certain direction, they're going to reach a point where they can't run anymore, which is a direct limitation in contrast to a world that's on a spherical orb. And so for me, I kind of liked that idea, but then I wanted to figure out how could it work? What are the lengths and limitations and what would a universe be like? And I have to admit, sometimes it was really hard because the other thing that I feel is very important to world building and it is a very strong mindset that I try to apply is to make it believable. Believable isn't, it should be understood because sometimes I also say make it realistic, but people say it's inherently not realistic because it's fantasy, but you can make things feel realistic by making them believable and by justifying certain things either with rules that are consistent in the world or even just by the laws of physics that exist in our real world. And you can find interesting ideas by looking into science what if kind of videos. Did you know that a donut shaped planet is actually possible? And like it could be, you know, uh, self-contained in an orbit and uh, like be structurally sound. Imagine a setting like a fantasy world that was set on a planet that was shaped like a donut and the differences that would create because they would have uneven distances to different areas. If you had a kingdom on the outside of the donut, okay, and there was a kingdom on the other side of the donut but it was on the inside, the logistical problems of trying to get back and forth are far different than just moving in one direction, okay, you can't move in one direction to get to that other kingdom. You have to constantly move around and stuff to get to where you need to go. And so the state of the physical land that people are living on is just one thing. For me, I decided to go, and it's not actually that original, it's just uh, continents that float in the end of the sky. I really like that concept. But this is where the interplay comes in because one, it's an idea that is taking the advantage of fantasy, that you can do anything, okay? You're not limited. So of course, we don't need a planet. We can just have continents floating in the sky. But then I wanted to marry that with trying to justify it and making it believable. Because why are the these things floating in the sky? What's causing them to float in the sky? Sometimes it's just magic, but that was unsatisfying. I wanted a mechanic to explain it. And the mechanic I used to explain why the continents float in the sky in my setting became the very underpinning technological foundation of a post-industrial society. And it was so fun and awesome to explore because it gave me a justification to make a, a world, a setting, where they were fairly advanced in certain areas, but because they were relying on this uh, 
it's a, it's a, it's a material, it's a, it's a type of stone that is physically locked in space when no light is shining on it. And there are vast kind of slabs that run the length of these continents, which lock them in, in, in space, in the sky, in place. And that is appropriate into technology. And they are based most of their technology on the interplay between dark stone that, and its polar opposite, a stone called sunstone. And they're advanced in that area, but that also made me justified to make them very unadvanced in other areas. So again, extrapolating things. And I'm going to talk about logical extrapolation because that's really important to nail down properly with world building because it creates consistency. There are a lot of pitfalls you can fall into if you make inconsistencies in the world building where you create either a technology, a magical material, a conditional state in a nation or uh, the land mass or something like that. And a logical extrapolation of one of these things aren't used which would be so obvious to people who live in the world. So that's important. I'm going to address more on it a bit later. But now I want to go back to focusing on this kind of tag team of two mindsets. One, you can do anything. And two, try and justify it at least logically. And you can make up rules, OK? I didn't need to resort to real world physics to try and justify why um, land masses were locked in space. I made something up. But I gave it very specific rules. And I was oh, so consistent to those rules that it actually comes off and feels like a set science and the way it operates is so predictable that I can then use it in inventive creative ways ways that you know the characters might not have thought of yet but if it's consistent with the rules it makes sense and then it can be used to resolve conflict in a really satisfying way now this is just one example but I think we need to stop like restricting ourselves to what we think a world should be look at our world and our state and you don't need to throw away everything because you want things to be relatable enough if you're having humans and, you know, another world setting with characters and like. But you can take even one thing and flip it on its head. And one of the other things that I did, flipped it on its head, did something completely different, was the size and shape of the universe itself. And this is something that is actually far more original to my setting because people have done floating islands before, but this was completely different because I need to try and justify the air pressure in the universe. And again, it's, it's trying to solve a problem logically that led me to a really original concept because it's fantasy. We can do anything. And this ability in fantasy shouldn't be belittled. Uh, you can just do any fantasy, so don't take it seriously. No, because when you are doing something that's, uh, that's out of the normal in a fantasy setting, if you can justify it logically, it can feel very serious, especially if you're consistent with it. And so I needed to find a way to justify the atmosphere in this you know, universe, because if I had the universe be the size of a regular universe, uh, the way that atmospheres work with, um, expand with air expanding with heat and contracting in cold and getting air currents, stuff like that, there would be storms and wind currents of the size of galaxies, if it was in the size of universe, it was a pressurized universe, that would reach the speeds of light in some instances, almost. And so, Yes, it was like problems beyond problems. But then suddenly if I shrunk the size of the universe, I could actually have an atmosphere operating in a far similar way to the way the atmosphere is on a planet. But I don't need to shrink it completely. I just flattened it. And so, all right, how would that work? Well, again, I looked to scientific theories, postulation stuff, and there was a documentary on, I forget where I watched it, when I watched it, but it was just on people, scientists, trying to theorize what the shape of the universe was. And one of the theories that they had when you reach the edge of our universe was that you can't actually exit the universe. Your literal physical state is only manifest by the laws that exist within our universe. So you can't leave it and still be in the same physical state. It's just, and so when you reach the edge of the universe, they postulate that you just re-enter it from the opposite side and that the universe is technically like spatially connected on every angle. And so, without going into too much confusion, I caught on that idea and I decided to use it. If I shrunk the universe horizontally to flat, and uh, then if you leave it, you just re-enter it from the top, and then I put gravity into the universe, so everything is being pulled down, except the continents which are fixed, I suddenly have a really cool and original world setting that has this really interesting, strange mechanic of this interplay of when they leave the universe at the bottom and just re-enter into the top, the thing that in the world that is called the barrier. And then I got to explore different ways of what this interaction with the barrier was, and it's one of the, you know, I don't want to spoil too much, but let's just say the magic 
system is related to the barrier as well, because we have no idea what exiting our universe, entering our universe would do. So I can just make anything up and it still feel, feels uh, consistent enough. And even if it wasn't consistent with the real world, it's consistent with the fantasy universe. So again, this is just looking at one thing, the shape of a universe in, in regards to a fantasy setting and saying, I can do whatever I want. It's fantasy. So what else could you do? What about gravity? Okay, would it, it would be an interesting fantasy world in which gravity literally wasn't a thing. It was, it, maybe you could take the fact that things with mass causes a space-time curvature, a geodesic curve that causes things to fall in towards it and stuff like that, and, and you can basically remove that force out of the universe, just gravity. Now that would cause so many issues if you try and extrapolate it because planets wouldn't be able to hold together and everything like that, so you would need a new mechanic to try and explain how planets could exist and other things like that. But let's go, instead of trying to justify it, let's try and explore what you could do in a setting that didn't have gravity in on a, you know, and what planets look like, but that alone, because Again, it's something that we are restricting ourselves because that's just how the world operates. Now, that could make it so different that it'll be hard to do a traditional kind of fantasy story in that sense, but I'm using it as an example that you don't need to be restricted by anything. It's fantasy. Try and think outside the box. In actual fact, there are so many interesting things that you can do that extrapolating each individual example is going to take too long. And so I'm going to be launching a new series on my uh, YouTube channel, just looking at one idea and then extrapolating and trying to explore all the different ins and outs of how this could affect society. And I'm going to list some of these video topics that I'm going to be going to as examples of things that you can just switch up that would make a really interesting and original fantasy world. For instance, what would a fantasy world look like if you were to consider it to be mostly Earth-like in terms of the progression, the biology of humans, stuff like that, and removed wood? trees, okay, or that um, uh, plant life only grew in bushes about a foot or so big, half a meter. That would throw a society on its head. Do you have any idea how influential and crucial timber has been for human advancement, okay? We build our homes with it, we use it as a source for fire and heat and light, and if you just take this one thing out of the picture, suddenly society and a human-like development system is flipped on its head completely massively so. The world and society and history would be completely different with this one change. This one change. Another example. What would a fantasy world be like if you couldn't have stable fire consistently? And there's a lot of different ways that you could achieve this. If uh, the humidity in this world was so high that it's too, everything is just too wet naturally that you can't get regular fire unless you really make something specific that you can get rid of the humidity and moisture in a sealed off, you know, uh, room or, uh, you know, thing. But then if you really want to take it further, change something in the physical nature of the materials, the elements, uh, okay, to make, to just take fire out of the picture completely. And then think about how much that would change a world setting incredibly so. And you can do this not just by taking things out of the status quo of what we think a world looks like based on what we know our own history world to look like, but you can do this by changing the way things operate. Like for me, I changed the way in which the land you lived on existed in space. It floated and the universe was different completely. Or you can add things in. I added in a fantasy element. Darkstone and Sunstone, which flipped the technological progress and the state of society completely, but I was also able to, you know, justify a really interesting, familiar in post-industrial setting, but it was founded on a completely different technological basis. What would happen to a society if humans stopped aging at the age of 25 or 30? What if reliable contraception existed much more? What if only one gender had access to magic? And we see that in Wheel of Time and the extrapolations that you can get there. I know both genders had access to magic, but it was very different, and of course, the I, well, no spoilers. Read the wheel of time, it's great. How would a society function if babies when they were born were far more physically stronger than the adults? You don't have to make them physically bigger, you could still keep them in a small package, but imagine what you'd have to do, because, uh, and keep babies operating the same way that babies do, uh, like, <laughs> That's just a wild card right there, right? Going back to the whole gravity thing, instead of taking gravity out of the picture, what about just changing the strength of gravity? Gravity being half as strong or double as strong, which affects how high people can jump, how the things people can lift, and that would affect the uh, biological evolution of the life on the planet as well. An interesting idea I kind of want to explore is a world setting in which humans are half the size as the regular people, but with no point of reference for that to be made aware in the context of the story. And so when you're reading it, humans are just in a world where all the animals 
seem far bigger and more imposing and are far more dangerous. And I'm going to actually go further with that and make every single animal basically a dire version. That there are no normal animals really exist. It's all dire animals and basically this world is a natural death zone but just on the biological, you know, life, but still keem familiar. Like, so a wolf will literally be a dire wolf that's twice, three times as big as a regular one. Same with horse and stuff like that. And just thinking about what a society would be like, and I picture these, you know, like any village is always having to have big walls kind of attack on Titan styles, and hunters would be regarded in much greater esteem to other people because they're literally, you know, hunting back, but also providing food. Uh, you wouldn't be out of farm regularly, or if you did, you'd have to be under guard and everything like that. I kind of like the idea that wool from these dire versions of sheep, which are like as big as horses, are actually the wool you get off them is stronger than steel. And so the armor is actually textile armor that can only be cut with like razor blade saws and stuff. And then they're wearing textile kind of armor that's better than full plate and things like that. And it's just that there's all these cool fun ideas that come from the simplest, smallest thing that change the, uh, I guess, strength comparison between a regular human and the entire animal kingdom and make all the animals like twice as strong as what they regularly are and still use familiar animals that we have in the real world, just make them larger. And so I'm not making up like, you know, cockatrices or strange weird, weird beasts. I'm just increasing. And it, again, throws everything else and it creates this really interesting danger filled setting that I reckon it's going to be really fun and I'm probably going to explore in the future. So think about the endless list of things that you can alter, change, remove, or even add in and then extrapolate. And that's what I want to talk about now because one of the key things about, you know, exploring different rays is extrapolating properly and realistically and consistently because we humans were very industrious little things, okay? And if any new technology, advancement, material, whatever is discovered, invented, we, we come across, right? We are going to try and figure out every possible use of this thing for our own benefit, okay? If it can be used for our own benefit, including and probably one of the most prominent ways, if it can be used as a weapon, okay? If there's any technology anywhere in the world, where humans naturally are always going to try and figure out if it can be weaponized or not, but also used in other applications. And this is one of the things that's bugged me so much with both Star Wars and Star Trek, and the fact that in, you know, the more prominent shows, I know this exists in video games and other things like that, but in the actual shows and movies, they rarely ever do this, portable shields, okay? They have shields on their spaceships, they have shown that you can get shields on a small enough package that uh, would fit a humanoid type person, and if they explain that if they're too small, they have too high radiation, stuff like that. Well, in Star Wars, you have the Gungan shields and everything, so they've already shown that this is possible. Sometimes in individual episodes, they have like a device. In Star Trek, they have a device that's this big, that's portable, and can project a shield, okay? No one is using it. I did, like, and uh, it just, uh, and you see a lot of this in Star Wars, both Star Trek, but it's just an example of poor world building where things are not extrapolated in such a way that it's, it becomes unrealistic or unbelievable because that's not how humans work. We would extrapolate and try and figure out all the ways in which things can be adapted to. So when you change, add, or any one of these things, especially if it's a big thing like, you know, uh, shape of the universe, something like that, you need to try and figure out all the ways how humans would use it, employ it, adapt it, and how it would affect the world on a larger scale. You just need a, all right, what about this? And keep going, keep going down the rabbit hole. Now, this is why you probably don't want to do too many different things because sometimes the calculations could be too overwhelming and then you don't think of obvious things and stuff like that. And I found it's always been helpful to focus on one thing at a time and I haven't really needed to change too much to make a really cool, interesting world setting. Sometimes it only needs to be as simple as changing the continent, shape of the universe, and then extrapolate. There are classic fantasies that I honestly feel haven't done this to a satisfying level, like the type of magic and what magic can achieve and how uh, readily available it is in Dungeons and Dragons. I'm not sure you could maintain a strictly medieval style setting with all the things magic can do. Now granted, there are some really interesting and creative kind of world settings that 
seem more in line with a world in which vast magic like this would be, um, uh, when vast magic like this would be available, like Forgotten Realms, where you have complete governments controlled by magic users and stuff like that, and there's class distinctions and how it affects, and so there are some instances very much in Forgotten Realms where they do a really good job, and sometimes I feel it's not nearly as satisfying. Invention can often be a result of necessity, and if you take away that necessity, certain inventions naturally would not be developed nearly as quickly or readily, or just not developed at all. And so if you have magical healing, how can you justify medical technology being advanced, um, just germ theory, herbs, and other things like that, if it's so available? It would advance if it's not nearly as available. And same with like D&D type magic. You could have D&D type magic in a med medieval setting if it wasn't nearly as available and widespread and only a few small individuals used it, then it wouldn't affect society nearly as drastically. But if it was widespread, commonly available, well then that would be affecting a lot of things, especially technological progression, depending on what the magic can do. In regards to healing, it would hinder and put a block on medical technology in quite a significant way. That's exactly what's happened in my book. Magical healing is so available that their medical technology is pretty horrible. And having said that, the medical technology of the medieval period just by itself was pretty horrible as well, so you don't necessarily need magic to justify that. So if you're introducing a new spell, okay, really, try and figure out how prevalent it is and how much it would affect society and even history, okay? Are our kingdoms built upon the foundation of this technology or spell or this utility or whatever? Now I could be listing endless examples, but then I think the video would honestly be too long, so I'll basically round it up now and say these are my three kind of main cardinal rules for taking your world building to the next level. The first one, don't restrict yourself to all the conditions that we have in the real world. It's fantasy. You can do anything you want. Two, when you do change something up, okay, try and justify it logically and consistently within the world because then you can actually employ those rules in the story. And I actually think I should expound on that a little bit more. But finally, the third rule, extrapolate, okay? If you're introducing or changing or something like that and you've justified it logically, figure out as much as you can, how it would affect society and how it would be employed. And then you can come back to what I was saying at the beginning of this video, you can start to use it in such fun ways in regards to the plot. So in my world setting, because Darkstone can literally subvert, okay, laws of gravity and other things like it because it's locked in space, they use this to create skyships and skyships are everywhere. And so trade and transportation are going through the roof in my world setting because they have such access to easy transportation and really effective and fast transportation. That are then affects warfare and economy, but how does it affect story? Well, your characters are living in these worlds, and so if they need to get from point A to point B, suddenly they have access to get from A to B much faster because of skyships. How do skyships operate? Is there a way to make them faster? Is there a way to make them slower? How do you disable them? How do they fight? How dangerous are they to operate? All these things are actually really important to figure out because they would naturally come into play in the story. And so these skyships can reach really fast speeds. So then what about G-force and restrictions? And so of course, there would be mechanical safety limitations to prevent these ships from accelerating too fast, from stopping instantly and having people become pancakes in the walls and to prevent them from turning too sharply and you'd be thrown onto the sides of the walls and all these things. So again, logical extrapolation. But then my character's in a situation where they actually need a skyship to go faster, but they can't because there are limitations built into it. So they have to disable the mechanical safeties of the ship. Who knows how to do that? Is there anyone trained to do it? Okay, and so now literally my character's in a situation where they need to do something, but they are prevented from doing something based on the world building and setting and technology and the rules that I have put in place, which creates tension and conflict and problems that they need to overcome and things that can be overcome in a satisfying way. Because in my book, I'll try and avoid spoilers, so I'm going to be speaking very vaguely, but the characters need a ship to do something and so naturally they disable the safety so it can do it easily. Come in later in the book, they're in a situation where they really importantly need a sky ship to do something and they don't have much time, but aha! Uh -huh the safeties have already been disabled on the ship because of the previous condition. And so suddenly that limiting restrictions like, oh no, we can't do something, is already resolved by it already happening previous to the plot. And it's like we instantly overcome a problem and you get the satisfaction of a victory because it's already justified in the setting. And this is how good world building can affect the story in dramatic and important ways. And therefore, even though it's not necessarily the most important thing of a story, it can elevate and enhance the story to new heights, okay? So 
it is very important. And I really encourage any writer to try and do it as good as possible. Be consistent with it. Because when you're not consistent with it, well then it can undermine things completely. And a perfect example of this, and I know I've complained about it a lot, but I need to point this out because this is probably the best example of when inconsistent world building elements robs a scene of how awesome it could have been. Because this could have been a phenomenal scene, but because it's inconsistent and contradicts world building in a massive way, so many people have just looked at that and felt it's stupid when it could have been awesome. And I'm talking about the Holdo maneuver from Star Wars The Last Jedi, okay? That scene is visually spectacular. Even in the cinema, I was like, that looks awesome. But then, oh, hang on, how does that work? That contradicts everything. And, and it, like, why haven't people been doing this before? Like, so many questions arise because of being inconsistent with a very important element in the world building, the way technology is used and employed in the setting. What would have been so cool if there was actual possibility provided in the technology somewhere else, and it's subtle, no, none of the audience have ever thought of it, but then it's explained that it can be done through these you know, elements, these rules that are already in place, and someone smart enough, a character smart enough, was just able to figure it out, and then do it, and then achieve something epic. And suddenly you have this brilliant scene that is also justified in the world building setting and technology and instead of being robbed of this awesome moment it enhances it even more because a character just did something really brilliant. So once again world building especially in fantasy shouldn't be belittled or taken less seriously or give less time devoted to it. I'm not saying spend years upon it, by the way. There is something like world building disease. Well, I forget the exact thing, but it's people who spend way too much time on world building. So um, I was trying to wrap it up, but this is important to also mention, yeah, and it's a tool that I use as well, is uh, you only need to world build enough for what is serviced in the story and plot, because that's the only parts of the world that you're actually showing the audience. All the other parts in the world, they're not being revealed to the audience. They're not even there. And so if you well built all these other nations, that's kind of wasted potential and time. You can utilize them, that's fine, later on in the story, and so it's good to have that kind of ammunition ready to go. But if you're not gonna be using it in the story, you're not using your time efficiently. And so something that I do, and a lot of other writers do, is I kind of list the nations, and, and if I come across someone in the nation, well then I'm like, okay, what are their characteristics, culture, things, and all I need to do is world build that for that given scene. But if I never come across someone from that nation, I have the name there, it's ready to be developed deeper when I need to, but I don't need to waste time on it because it's not appearing in the story. And so this is like the smoke and mirrors of world building where when you see an iceberg, you think there's, you know, logically, because if you know anything about icebergs, the underside, there's a much deeper iceberg underneath the surface. But in regards to world building, all you need to show is the top of the iceberg to imply the depth of it underneath. I really got this impression, and I could be completely wrong, but when we're reading Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan, it's so interesting where he has certain characters mention past events, battles, uh, a specific general who took this mighty stand, and one character in particular becomes connected with history. I'm not gonna give spoilers, but because he has a connection with history, these different historical moments pop up continually through the book, and you get immersed by this rich, vast history of uh, the Wheel of Time, but I wonder how vast it needs to be, or even if it is that vast. It probably is, because well, Robert Jordan is a phenomenal world builder. I'm not saying um, uh, this wasn't done. But it also showed that this scene where this general and this battle was mentioned, I, if I were writing a book, I could actually just mention that scene, that battle, and leave it there, and I would give the exact same implication of a vast, rich history without having to write that vast, rich history of this kingdom, this nation, their cultures, their practices, their hereditary lines, okay? Uh, all the things, I actually, you don't need to do it, okay? You can just hint at it, imply by the story that there is a vast, rich history, but then you don't need to go to the trouble of doing it, because so many of these battles and things, some are mentioned again, like Utter Hawkwing, okay, becomes Am I saying that? Auto, auto, auto. Wheel of Time fans are really going to roast me there. Um, um, just because of the pronunciation. But he becomes really significant and is a historical figure that becomes referenced and mentioned quite a lot. Manethrin becomes a very important historical nation, country that, you know, I won't give spoilers, but referenced a lot in the Wheel of Time. And so there are important histories, so don't get me wrong, when they become integral to certain elements of the story, 
you need, you know, like detailed world building to explain all the history and stuff. But there are so many nations, peoples and events mentioned only once in the real time, never revisited. And they give the impression of that vast rich history, but nothing else is really revealed. And even if there is a vast rich history that Robert Jordan had written for it, you don't actually need it. And that's kind of the lesson I took from that is like, huh. I can actually just do these kind of hints and world build to the level that is needed for the story. And because of that, I can make a novel that is complemented to very, in very high regard for the quality of world building. But there are areas in which uh, I, this might be disappointing that I haven't even needed to develop yet because they weren't in the story yet. But when I come to, you know, in book two, the part where, OK, characters now gone to a new nation that I haven't visited before. Then I'll need to really nail down their cultural norms and practices to far greater detail, history, um, the government style, the fashion sense and all those things. But I haven't done that for all the cultures in my book. And people have commented like that. I love all the different cultures because different people from different cultures are shown in the book and they're mentioned that these cultures are there. They're mentioned in the histories and stuff like that. But as to the detail, most of them are nowhere near as detailed as the main culture and, and nation in which the book is based in, which is Samara, which I have a vast history written for. I have different locations and events and peoples mentioned, all those things really detailed because that is what was needed. So important little trick about world building there. You don't need to world build everything. You just need to world build what is needed for the story. But there are people who just love world building everything. And so I'm not saying don't, but if you want to use your time efficiently for writing stories, uh, there is a, you know, too, there is a syndrome of world building too much and you spend years and years upon world building and never get to the story. And if you want to write novels, you should use your time efficiently. So there we go. Uh, how to take your world building to the next level, some of the things that I do and the practices and mindsets that have really helped me achieve what many people have regarded to uh, be fairly good world building. And I'm flattered by the compliments as well. So thank you and thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. And of course, I hope to see you again. So until that time, farewell.